Well, it has indeed been my privilege to be a part of this conference. Listening to John, David, and Rob speak, I can tell you, it's done me some good. How about the rest of you? You know, in all seriousness, uh, I have for the last six years or so been out between 30 and 35 weekends a year in churches all over the United States, now a few in Canada, and um, and South America, different islands in the Caribbean. But when you're out that many Sundays, believe me, after a while, it does get wearisome, wearisome and I need to hear some good preaching. And so it was good to be here and hear these men speak to the truth, especially some of the things that they brought out. You know, Gary, Brother Gary, has had a tremendous book table out there. I remember at the camp last year, he had a great selection. I know a number of you have gone by there, and a lot of you know him. He's got a little set of booklets back there, I think six or seven different ones, different titles. A pocket guide, in this case, to compromise, compromising with Genesis chapter 1. Make sure you go back there and take a look at some of those. They're not very expensive at all, and uh, I think... Uh, there's quite a number of them available now on the Answers in Genesis website, and he's got a good group of them back there. You know, we've heard a lot of different points made over the last couple of days, and I can also tell you that as a group who have come to attend the conference, it does my heart good to see the number of people who have come. You know, in years past, back in those smoky mountains of Tennessee, uh, an evangelist could go out and call a revival. They'd set up a tent and they'd fill it. Now they still call revivals, but they get 20 people, 30 people, 50 maybe if they're lucky. What's going on? Something's happening. And of course, we've heard a lot of things talked about over this last couple of days from some great speakers who have brought a lot of that to light. And many times we wonder why our churches aren't full, why they seem to be fading. Oh, there seems to be some churches out there that people can, you know, set up and they put all kinds of names on them, you know, the, you know, the New Age Church, the growing, I mean, they seem to grow up overnight in two or three years, run from nothing to 2,000 or something like that. And yet it seems like the churches that are speaking and teaching the truth of God's word it's all they can do to hold the membership that they have. What's happening? Something's happening. And I believe that part of the problem is the fact that we, as God's people, have begun to compromise with this whole idea of creation. We have compromised the very first foundational chapters of the Bible. And as I pointed out the other day, Henry Morris said, if you can believe the first ten words of Genesis, you're not going to have any trouble believing the rest of the Bible. But if you can't, truly believe them, you'll have all kinds of trouble. I think that's where we're at when it comes to the church today. This particular message I've simply titled The Consequences of the Path That You Choose because there are indeed consequences for everything that we do, including the choice that we make when it comes to our world view. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to a very simple verse, pair of verses that I've used and I think it helps draw the parallel that I want to, or, or, or draw the contrast that I want to draw in this particular message. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, where we read the inspired writer of Scripture. He says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. When I ran across this passage a number of years ago and began to contemplate it and put the message together around this particular passage, I asked the question, you know, what are these two paths? Where do they lead in the end? And you know, God himself answers that question in Proverbs chapter 14. He says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I heard it said earlier in this conference, when God says something, we need to pay attention, and we do. But when he says it twice, we really need to pay attention. And just a couple chapters down in Proverbs chapter 16, I believe it's verse 25, he says it again. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
Now today, the path that most Americans are choosing to follow, the path that indeed many people in the world are choosing to follow, is what we call the path of evolutionary humanism. Now there's one of those big words, you know, speakers use them all the time, don't they? They roll them off like they're nothing, and I you know, hate that when it happens because I'm, you know, the, the pre preacher's 15 minutes into his message and I'm still hung up back there on the big word trying to figure out what it meant. Any of you all have that kind of problem? Well, let's break that evolutionary humanism apart. First of all, let's define humanism. Humanism is relatively simple. It's everything is about me. I am the center of the universe. It's what I like. It's what I want. It's what I need. It's what I care about. I'm the center of the universe. That's what humanism really is. On the other hand, evolution, and I've kind of hinted at it over the last number of sessions, but I want to clearly define it here. The word evolution, the way they are teaching it in the government schools in the United States, and I, da and I dare say the way they're teaching it here in Canada as well. Evolution means vertical evolution from particles to people over billions of years. You know, that word evolution has come to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people today. And I was down in Peru, in Lima, my third trip down there, working with our missionaries that we have down there that are teaching creation in a city of 12 million. And I walked out of George's airport, and on the far left-hand left side of the parking lot, I saw a really large billboard sign. I later had one of those V8 moments. Not that I wish that I had a V8, but... I wished I'd have taken a picture of the sign. Because if I had, I wouldn't have to describe to you what was on that sign, right? I mean, why? Because a picture tells a thousand words. Kind of like this picture here tells a thousand words. <laughs> you would not want to make a decision right at that particular point, would you? Can't you just picture the highway patrolman on the motorcycle just waiting there behind the sign, write you a ticket? Anyway, here is this huge billboard sign, and it illustrates what one person thinks the word evolution means. On the far left-hand side of the sign was a picture of one of those old Tandy 1000 SX computers. It had two, mind you, two five and a half inch 360K floppy drives. Not gig, not meg, not terabytes, K. Some of you older folks may remember one of those. Next to it was a picture of a computer that had a little three and a half inch floppy drive. Next to it was a picture of a computer that had zip drives and hard drives in it. And finally, on the far right hand side of that sign was a picture of one of these wafer thin laptop computers. And emblazoned across the top of the sign in letters taller than I am were the words, the evolution of the computer. Now, to the person that dreamed up that advertising campaign, of course, the word evolution simply meant what? Change. Have computers changed? Yeah, they've changed a bunch. You know, take a look at this picture here. This is a picture of a 40 megabyte hard drive from 1967. It took a forklift to lift it up in the side of the airplane. Plugged right in there on the side of my laptop is a little drive about that long that's 36 or 32 gigabyte. Have computers changed? Yeah, they've changed a bunch. I mean, look what they've been talking about for years. A computer that would project a virtual keyboard on the tabletop that you would type on, or two pens that you keep in your pocket. One projects the screen, one projects the keyboard on the table that you type it. Have computers changed? Yes, they have. But that is not what the word evolution means, the way they teach it in the public education, or I like to say today, in the government schools in the United States. They're teaching vertical evolution, particles to people. One kind evolved into a higher, more complex kind that evolved into a yet a higher and more complex kind. And folks, that had to happen not once or a thousand. It had to happen billions times, billions of times in order to get from particles to people. What they're really teaching is that man is the top of the food chain, that man determines truth and what truth is. Therefore, man can change the definition of truth anytime he wants to. That truth for me might not be the same as truth for you or you. We all determine our own truth. What they're really teaching is that man is the God in control of his own life. And it's a lie. 
You see, what they're teaching is that evolution is the answer to all of our problems when it comes to dealing with God. You know, I think about the fact that what's going on. And it's so insidious because it sounds so good to our young people. I told you, I was a preacher's kid and a missionary kid. We came back from Thailand in 1962. I entered the public education system in Appleton, Wisconsin for the very first time. Started hearing about evolution in Roosevelt Junior High School. Folks, I went to a missionary boarding school. I was raised on the mission field. I never heard of such a thing. Kids would ask me, what do you think about this evolution thing? I'd say, well, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's good enough for me. There's some of you sitting here today that think that. And then when I got into my 20s, and they started talking about carbon-14 dating, that proves the world is millions of years old. People would ask me, what do you think about that? I'd say, well, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if he took a million years to do it, that's still okay with me. Some of you may think that. But you see, what I didn't understand was I was beginning to take, to take the words of scientists who don't know everything, who have fallen brains, and who were not there at the beginning, and I was adding their words to the words of one who was there at the beginning, who does know everything, and told us how he did it. And I didn't realize you didn't need to do that. But more importantly, what I want you to realize today is that as I heard that, slowly that evolutionary stuff started to sink in. Parents, grandparents, you listen to me. Your young people want to believe in evolution. Boy, that's some strong words. You know why? It teaches them they're the God in control of their own life. They can do anything they want to. They're at the top of the food chain. If it feels good, do it. You only go around once in life. When you die, that's it. End of story. They put your body in the ground. That's it. Tell me what young person wouldn't want to believe in that. What are we telling them? Don't do this. Don't do that. If you do, it's called sin. You're going to hell. And so what I'm trying to get across to you is that we need to understand that Evolutionary humanism is very, very seductive. Even adults have trouble with it, don't we? Because we want to believe that we have control of our life. We want to have part and parcel in our salvation, and on and on it goes. You see, what they're really teaching the young people is that through a process of death, disease, bloodshed, and struggle over millions of years, that accounts for how man got here. That's what brought man into existence. The Bible, on the other hand, teaches something very different. It teaches, no, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth perfect. Man's sin is what brought death, disease, bloodshed in the world. Sin is not a normal part of life, and the world has been going downward ever since. Two distinctly opposite worldviews. They are going in opposite directions, each winding up in two different destinations, each carrying two different sets of eternal consequences. And that's what this message is all about, the consequences of the path you choose. You see, the church has forgotten something today. We've forgotten a lot of things. These men have been talking about some of the things that have been going on, and I'm very appreciative of what they've done. But we've forgotten something else. We've forgotten a very simple concept that ideas have consequences. See, evolution is an idea about how the world and everything got here without God being involved. Creation is an idea about how everything got here with God doing it. Two different worldviews. And they have consequences for those worldviews. Let me illustrate that. You all know who this guy is. His name is Adolf Hitler. What you may not know about Hitler is that he believed Darwinian biological evolution hook, line, and sinker. He believed that Darwin was right, that we all evolved from some common ape-like ancestor. Therefore, Hitler reasoned, that means some of us are further along the evolutionary line than others. Therefore, we are superior. And it's a lie. Folks, racism comes right out of the pit of hell. It is not biblical. Paul says in Acts chapter 17, we are all of one blood. There is only one human race. And he goes on in that passage to say the very bounds, the habitations, the times in which we are going to live is appointed by God. 
But Hitler didn't believe that. He believed Darwin was right. And so when he came to power, he didn't have any problem with killing millions of gypsies, Jews, and blacks. Why? He was simply being true to his evolutionary worldview. He was, in his view, exterminating subspecies of humans that had not evolved as far as the Aryan race had. Thank goodness he was not allowed to prevail. Because if he had, once again, we would be living in a very different world than we are today. You see, we're talking about two different worldviews. The biblical worldview says God created the heavens and the earth. The evolutionary worldview says man's opinion is what counts. That we got here without a God being involved. In fact, you want to know how to build a bomb in the public education system? This is how you do it, and we've done it in the United States. You instill in the child that there are no absolutes. Teach the child that life is an accident. That people are nothing more than evolved animals. Millions of years of death, disease, bloodshed, and struggle. That's what brought humans into existence. Then teach those children that there is no God. Then remove the Bible, prayer, and Ten Commandments from the school and just stand back and wait. Folks, it will explode. And then we wonder why kids take guns into schools like Columbine or Virginia Tech close to where I live and blow away a bunch of their classmates. Folks, it shouldn't surprise us. Why would it surprise us? We've been teaching them for two generations. They're nothing more than evolved animals. Why would we be surprised when they begin to act like animals? And I'm going to tell you something. Right there in Mountain City, Tennessee, where I live in Johnson County High School, now, understand, East Tennessee and the Smoky Mountains, that is the buckle on the Bible Belt. And you go out to that high school and you sit in there, it is appalling the behavior you see going on by these young people, 16, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds. See, we're talking about two worldviews. On the one hand, if you believe man got here through the process of evolution, what you're really saying is that man's opinion is what counts. And out of that opinion, out of that worldview, comes certain types of behavior. People act certain ways based on their worldviews. You see things like school violence, lawlessness, homosexual behavior, pornography, abortion. You can probably think of enough blocks to stack that all the way through the ceiling. On the other hand, if you believe in God's word, it's the foundation of everything. If you believe that God created the heavens and the earth, it means that you should understand that if he created it, he owns it and everything in it, including you and me. And if he owns it, it means he has the right to set the rules for living life. And if he has the right to set the rules for living life, it means he has the, the, the right to execute the penalty when you break the rules. And I like to tell the young people, let me tell you something. If God had the power to create the heavens and the earth in the first place, you can count on the fact that he has the power to execute the penalty when you break the rules. Well, if that's your worldview, there's a whole different set of behaviors that happen. Let's just use the example of alcohol. Now, I, I use this for, for a reason that's very simple. We could talk about drug abuse in its many forms. We could talk about sexual, illicit sexual activity in its many forms. We could talk about lying, cheating, stealing, any number of problems you want to talk about. But let's just talk about alcohol and let's compare how your worldview affects your behavior regarding that. Now, I'm an American. I'm over 21, barely, of course, but I... I have a right as an American to drink if I want to. Now, if my worldview is the evolution worldview and I work down through the week and Friday I get a pink slip, I lose my job, why not go out and get drunk? It's my right as an American. Now, if millions of Americans go out and get drunk, and of course millions of Americans do go out and get drunk, why would we be surprised when some of them get in their car and drive drunk, wander across the median, slam head on into a van carrying a whole family, killing half of that family, maiming the other half, they wind up in the hospital. Cumulatively, hospital costs begin to rise. Cumulatively, doctor costs begin to rise, begin to rise. and then cumulatively, insurance premiums begin to rise and you and I all get to pay a little piece of it in increased insurance premiums. I don't know about the rest of you. That makes me mad. 
Now, on the other hand, if I believe that God created the heavens and the earth, like I said, it should mean that I understand that he owns it and everything in it. And if I believe the Bible teaches God's word says, stay away from strong drink. And if you don't, there's a penalty. Do you think if I get a pink slip that Friday and that's my worldview, do you think that that worldview might modify my behavior a little bit? That I might think twice before I go out and get drunk? Now I like to point out, don't misunderstand me here, a lot of times Christians do things they had not to be doing, don't they? But the point is that your worldview modifies your behavior. You know, there was a man named Jim Black a number of years ago wrote a book called When Nations Die. And in that book, he identified ten factors that could bring a culture crashing down. Let me show you the ten. Number one is an increase in lawlessness. Another one was a loss of economic discipline. Yet another one was the rising things or the rising avenues of bureaucracy, especially government red tape. Another one was the declining or the dumbing down of the educational system. Another was the weakening of cultural foundations. Yet another one was the loss of respect for traditions. Folks, traditions is the way we pass moral values on to the next generation. Now, they can be good or bad, but that's how we pass them on. Another one is an increased materialism. Yet another is a rise in immorality, especially the homosexuality form of immorality. Another is the decay of religious belief. And finally, number 10 is the devaluing of human life. I love what was said earlier in one of the sessions. God countenances a lot of sin. He won't forever, but he lets it, seems to let it go for a while. But he will not countenance the shedding of innocent blood. That's an absolute fact when you look at the Scripture. When Dave talked about Moloch and some of those, I mean, the way they sacrifice their kids. It's just it's scary. But when we look at this list, I don't know how, about how it is here in Canada, but I can tell you, every one of those is present in the United States. He found that for the first time in history, in his research, all ten of them are present at the same time in the same nation. It's the United States. And yet he also found in his research that only two of them was what brought down the Roman Empire. Primarily two of them. The mighty Roman Empire collapsed. Now here's a very, very important point. When it comes to this worldview issue, you can believe whichever one of these two worldviews you want to believe. You can believe in evolutionary humanism. You can believe in biblical creation. You can believe the world got here without a God being involved. You can believe that got here with God doing it. Nobody is standing with a gun to your head telling you you have to believe one of the worldviews or the others, at least not in the United States, not yet. I assume they're not doing that in Canada yet. But while you're free to choose whichever one of these two worldviews you want to believe, you are not free of the consequences that come with the choice. And not only do the consequences affect you, they affect your children, your family, your schools, your community, indeed they affect your entire province and country. Or in my case, the entire state that I live in, the United States that we love. People ask me all the time, what is going on in the United States? I'll tell you exactly what's going on. What we are seeing is the cumulative choices of millions of Americans choosing to believe in evolutionary humanism and now their actions are resulting in all of the terrible things we see going on all over the place down there. And now we're seeing it in the leadership that they keep electing, election after election. What was the passage of Scripture? But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not what they stumble. So the first question I have for you in my final session today is what path are you on? Are you on the wrong path? The good news is if you're on the wrong path, you can change the path that you're on. Are you starting to believe that maybe evolutionary humanists have proved the world's billions of years old, but you know God's Word is true, so somehow the two fit? The good news is you got time to go to God's Word and study it out for yourself and realize that He said exactly what He meant, and He meant exactly what He said. 
created it in six days. Exodus 20, 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Now I used to have a really big problem with this because I couldn't understand how we've allowed this to happen in the United States or let's say in North America because Canada and America are essentially joined at the hip. Are we not? As Canada goes, America goes. As America goes, Canada goes. It's as simple as that. We both have a common heritage in the British Empire. You know, it, it, it used to really cause me a lot of concern. How have we got there? How have we as the church, how have we as individual Christians allowed this to happen? It's because we've allowed the secular humanists to define the debate. We've let them do that in a lot of different areas. I appreciated the strong statement about abortion. I mean, that's one of the issues we've let them define the debate. We see, you see, we've let them say that the, uh, the debate about abortion in the United States is about a woman's right to choose. Folks, a woman has always had a right to choose. The choice is made when she lays down with a man and has a relationship. Once conception takes place, you do not have the right to murder the life of the unborn. But that's why we're losing that debate. We've let them say that it's about a woman's right to choose. No, it's not. They've always had that right. It's about the right to murder the unborn. And if we could ever get that debate reframed, we'd win that debate. Well, we've let them do the same thing about this creation evolution thing. We've let them say that evolution is science, but creation is religion. If you want to believe that religious mumbo jumbo, that's okay. Keep it in the four walls of your churches, but don't bring it out here into the public arena because we teach real science in the government education system. Folks, let me tell you something. Evolution is not science, never has been, it never will be. I mean, what is science? First of all, science is a noun. I always put that up there so that just in case there's some English teachers here, I want to make sure we get that right. But there's a classic definition of science. You know, you go to the dictionary and you look up a definition that's got number one, number two, number three, and the most common meaning is always number one. All right, number one is a branch of knowledge or study dealing with a body of facts systematically arranged and showing the operation of general laws. And then about 40 years ago, they added a second major definition, and that is the systematic knowledge of the physical or material world that's been gained through observation and experimentation. Now, I want to apply both of these definitions to evolution as a worldview and creation as a worldview. I want to see which one's science, which one's religion. Are they both science? Are they both religion? Let's go to evolution first. Is evolution based upon a branch of knowledge or study that deals with a body of facts, is it systematically arranged? Does it show the operation of the general laws of science? The answer is no, no, and no. Not one single fact supports vertical evolution. Folks, I defined evolution for you. You need to burn that definition into your mind. Vertical evolution from particles to people is what they teach. We are not talking about horizontal variation within a kind. Every time you get into an argument with an evolution, say, oh, we see evolution happening all the time. And then they start off with some example. Folks, just to give you an example. There's 270 different breeds of dogs on the planet today. You got little Toy poodles you can hold in your hand, great big Great Danes that a lot of you could probably ride on and everything in between. Dogs with long bodies and short legs, their bellies drag the ground. Dog with lots of hair, dogs with no hair, dogs with lots of skin, you can pull it over their face, make their face disappear. They're just dogs. You never see dogs changing into cats or horses or something else. We're not talking about horizontal variation within a kind. God programmed that right in the DNA of the first pair. We're talking about vertical evolution from particles to people over billions of years. Not one single fact supports vertical evolution, let alone a whole body of facts. Well, is that vertical evolution? Is it systematically arranged? Does it show the operation of the general laws of science? No. The second law of thermodynamics, for instance, the law of entropy. Everything is wearing out and breaking down. Everything is going from high order to disorder, from complexity to simplicity. Folks, what does evolution teach? 
It teaches everything's evolving upwards into higher and higher, more complex life forms. It's going directly contrary to one of the two most proven laws of science. No scientist of any reputation whatsoever will dispute the validity of the first and second law of thermodynamics, and yet they teach you that evolution's true. It's going opposite. How about the second definition? Is evolution based upon the systematic knowledge of the physical or material world that's been gained through observation and experimentation? Again, the answer is no. I mean, what is empirical science? In order to be empirical science, it must encompass three things. We call it the scientific method. Number one, it must be observable. Got to start with observation. Number two, it must be testable. Number three, it must be repeatable or falsifiable. Folks, has anybody ever seen vertical evolution happen? No. Has anybody ever found any evidence that vertical evolution from one kind into a higher, more complex kind happened in the past? No. Folks, they have been looking for the missing link for 150 years ever since Darwin first postulated it. There's a reason they call it the missing link. It's still missing. Always will be. Why? It's not there. Have they ever figured out a way to test evolution to see if it could happen in the future? No. What does that mean? It means that evolution, vertical evolution, therefore, is outside of the realm of empirical science. Therefore, it's philosophical. It's a faith-based belief system. People believe in evolution even though there's no scientific evidence to support it. What about creation? Was anybody here today there when God created the heavens and the earth? No. Is God creating stuff out of nothing today, ex nihilo? No. What does that mean? That means creation is also outside of the realm of empirical science. It is a faith-based belief system. You can believe whichever one you want. But there's consequences that come with that choice. One of the One of the things evolutionists love to say is they like to say, well, no real scientist with a real Ph.D. from a real university believes in creation. All of the real scientists, they know that evolution is a fact. Well, I got news for them. There are thousands upon thousands of scientists with Ph.D.s who believe that God created the heavens and the earth just like he said he did. There's a book that you can get on the Answers in Genesis website called In Six Days, Why 50 PhDs Believe that God Created the Heavens and the Earth in Six Ordinary Days, just like he said he did. Each writes a chapter from his or her scientific discipline, why the science from their discipline shows the creation is true. Now there's a second book called The Seventh Day, 40 more PhDs, each writing a chapter. But you see, we have another problem that's even more basic than that, and that is the problem with the evidence. We have a wrong conception about the, uh, about the, the evidence out there. We have this idea that over here in this pile is all of the scientific evidence that supports evolution and shows it to be true. And over here is another pile of evidence, and in this pile is all of the scientific evidence that supports creation and shows it to be true. And there's this big argument going on between the scientists. The evolutionary scientists are saying, our evidence is a lot better than yours. The creationists are saying, "Uh uh-uh, ours is a lot better than yours. And the evolutionists are saying, nah, uh ours is better than yours. Folks, that's not what's going on at all. The creationists and the evolutionists have exactly the same pile of evidence to look at. The only difference is the presuppositions that they look at the evidence with. There's one of those big words. What's a presupposition? It's your worldview. It's what you believe about how everything in the world got here. And depending on what you believe about that, when you put on that evolutionary worldview or biblical worldview, that pair of glasses, if you would, and you look at a piece of evidence, it is going to color and shape the decision, the conclusion you draw about that piece of evidence. There's an excellent way to illustrate this perfectly. Candy and I, as I mentioned before, we've rafted down the canyon Grand Canyon several times. We've hiked down into it multiple times. And as I said yesterday, we've flown over it in a small four-place airplane several times now. 
Well, one time back about 2013, 2014, somewhere in there, nine, eight, nine years ago, we were walking down into the canyon on the Bright Angel. How many of you were at the canyon? Number of you been to Grand Canyon? How many of you been there? Right. Were you at the How many of you been to the North Rim? Only a couple. Believe me, that's I'd like that one the best, but y'all ought to go there sometime too. But the South Rim, all right. If you've gone to the Bright Angel Trail, actually the Bright Angel Cottages, the trail starts right down there. That's where the mule ride goes down from the South Rim. All right. We were hiking back out of the canyon on the Bright Angel Trail. And as we were hiking back out, the three of us, our son was about 13 or so, somewhere in there, 13 or 14. I don't remember for sure. The years just kind of fly by anymore. And a matter of fact, we were right here, right at this particular point. And as we were coming up, we were getting ready to start up all these switchbacks coming out. We were right at the base of this layer called the Coconino Sandstone. It's not quite a thousand feet thick. And underneath it are a whole bunch of red layers, the Supai group. But as we came around this switchback right here, here's a guy standing there. He's in his mid-40s. He's got the cargo shorts on, the fly fisherman's vest, the hiking boots, the grizzled beard, the hat. He kind of looked like an Indiana Jones kind of character. And he's talking to a young woman in her early 20s. And as we walked around that switchback there and came around it, over my shoulder I hear him say to the young woman, and the Colorado River took millions of years to erode and downcut the canyon. And I turned around, and as I did, Candy said under her breath, don't you say a word. <laughs> and of course, I couldn't help it because that's what I do. So I said to the guy, sir, I couldn't help but overhear what you said. How do you think the canyon formed? Well, he looked down here at the little ribbon of the Colorado River. He says, it's obvious. It took millions of years for the Colorado River to erode and downcut the canyon. I said, oh, really? And he looked at me kind of funny. He says, why, what do you think? And I says, well, what you want me to believe is that little tiny bit of water over a whole lot of time, that's what cut the canyon. I said, I don't think so. I think it's the opposite. I think it was a whole lot of water over a little short period of time to cut the canyon. He says, well, you must be one of those creationists. And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. So there we went back and forth. Three hours later, we're still... Candy hates it when I do that. Actually, uh, she's, been a, she's been a really great companion on all those trips that we make out there. And she could tell you, we've gotten into a lot of different discussions over the years in all those places like Bryce Canyon and Zion Canyon. And if, I, if somebody doesn't say something to get it going, I'll say something to get it going. But anyway, so here's the point. Two scientists looking at exactly the same piece of evidence. What is that evidence? The Grand Canyon. Important evolutionists. Why? It's the best exposed evidence of the geologic column anywhere in the world, according to them. One of them says it formed over millions of years. The other said it formed thousands of years ago. What is the difference? It's the world view. He looked at the canyon already believing in billions of years of evolution. So millions of years for the Colorado River to erode the canyon fit perfectly within his world view. I looked at the very same piece of evidence already believing God's word teaches that there was a huge catastrophic event called Noah's flood about 4,400 years ago. So thousands of years fit within my worldview. Two different scientists coming to two different, very, very different conclusions about the same piece of evidence. You know, I used to get really frustrated because I've, I've done this for so many years and I, you know, when you're going to do something like this, most people would be like me. You'd want to, sharpen the arguments and you want to find some really good ones you know that you can just nail them with and so I, you know, sometimes I would put a, a really good piece of evidence in front of an evolution and say see how this shows creation they'd look at it what that doesn't show how that supports creation it just shows how it took 700 million years for that to evolve into that of course I'd get really frustrated and you don't want to I was fighting words Finally, God gave me some peace. I finally came to understand that evolutionists don't believe in evolution because they're stupid. Now, I know that sounds terrible to say it that way, but I mean it. I'm serious. There are thousands of brilliant scientists across the United States and Canada, indeed around the world, that believe in evolution. Folks, they don't believe in evolution because they're stupid. They believe in it because they're 
blind. They can't see the scientific evidence from the proper perspective. I love to illustrate graphically what I'm talking about. There's a guy named Beaver who travels around the streets and sidewalks of Europe. He paints pictures on those sidewalks. And as you're looking at these pictures that he painted, I want you to remember these pictures or paintings he's painted are two-dimensional. They are flat on the sidewalk, yet they look three-dimensional. The guy's got a great talent. It's incredible what he can do with these paintings. In fact, in this one coming up, he painted a picture of himself on the sidewalk so that it looks like he's helping himself paint the picture. Can you tell which one's him? He's the one on the right. Why am I showing you this? I'm trying to illustrate this point that evolutionary humanists cannot look at the evidence from the proper perspective. You remember that first picture I showed you? That is the wrong perspective. Let me show you the perspective that the creator of that painting wanted you to look at it from. That is where those people are standing over there. It makes all the difference in the world. And do you know what, folks? There's a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 that says, He, God, can be clearly seen by the things He has made, even His eternal power and Godhead. And then comes the indictment so that they are without excuse. The fact that He is can be clearly seen in the creation. You're not going to be able to say one day, God, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were real. Now, evolution, that's vertical evolution from particles to people, actually fits the definition of science fiction much better than the definition of science. What is that? Science fiction is a form of fiction that draws imaginatively on scientific knowledge and what? On speculation. Look at this quote by an evolutionist. He says, quote, while recognizing that much is unknown or un imperfectly known, I have been able to unfold the fascinating story of the hominid evolution of the human brain using science. No, he says, using creative imagination, restrained by rational criticism. Look at this quote by an evolutionist. He says, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Folks, evolutionists don't know what got the Big Bang booming. They don't know what most of the universe is made of, what material is made of. They say that evolutionary happenings are unique, unrepeatable, and irreversible. And by the way, that's three more quotes by evolutionists. Folks, they make these kind of statements all the time. By their own admission, evolution is based on speculation and imagination. That's what the definition of science fiction is. And then they got the nerve to say somebody like me is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Look at this quote by Dr. Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous evolutionary humanists of our time. He is traveling around the United States making an apologetic for evolutionary humanism like I make an apologetic for biblical creation. Look what he wrote. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. But I'd rather not consider that. Folks, he's talking about me. He's talking about you, any one of you, if you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. But I like to point out to people and ask the question, did you notice what Dr. Dawkins said? Look closely at what he said. He said it's absolutely safe to say if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution. And that's my point. Evolution is a faith-based belief system. You can believe in it if you want. But there's consequences that come with the choice. How many of you here today have read Darwin's book? Raise your hand. A couple of you. There's four things that every believer, that every Christian needs to know about Charles Darwin's book. Number one, it was published in 1859. Number two, the title was On Origin of the Species. Number three, what was the one thing Darwin did not discuss in that book? 
He never talked about the origin of the species. He talked about how one thing could change or evolve into something else, but never talked about where they came from in the first place. Number four, what degree did Darwin have? Did he have a PhD in science? No. He had a BA, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology, the study of God. And there's some people that question even if that degree was a valid one. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because you need to understand that on origin of the species has become the evolutionary humanist's Bible. They refer to that book with great reverence and respect. And back in 1971, they made one of the largest reprints of Darwin's book that they've ever made. They printed millions of copies. Why? That's the year they began putting them in mass in the public schools, the public libraries, the universities, the high schools in the United States. Millions of copies. And before they published that in 71, they asked a strong evolutionist named Dr. Harrison Matthews to write the introduction, the foreword to Darwin's book. I want you to notice what Dr. Matthews wrote. He wrote, quote, The fact of evolution is the backbone of biology. And a lot of people in the United States and churches think they didn't start teaching evolution as a fact until the last 10 years or so. Folks, they've been doing it for a long time time. But look what he goes on to say. He says, and biology is thus in the peculiar position of being a science founded on an unproved theory. Is it then a science or a faith? I mentioned this quote at Virginia Tech University when I spoke there, and a young man jumped up. He says, oh, you creationists, you always twist and turn everything we say to make it mean what you want to mean. No, we don't do that. They do that to us all the time. But we answer to a higher authority. We try to be accurate. Look what Dr. Matthews goes on to say. Belief in the theory of evolution is thus exactly parallel to belief in special creation. Both are concepts which believers know to be true, but neither, up to the present, has been capable of proof. And that's exactly my point. This evolutionist made it too. Evolution is a faith-based belief system. The evolutionists know it. Now you know it. So don't ever go out there and let anybody ever again say that evolution is science, but creation is religion. Evolution is not science. It's a faith-based religion too. Once you can establish that, that both are faith-based religious belief systems, then we can sit down and we can have a discussion, all right, which one of these religious systems does the science point at? And I will guarantee you they will lose that debate. Dr. Dwayne Gish, one of the two founders of the Institute for Creation Research who just went home to be with the Lord about a month ago, has been saying this for years. In fact, he's the one that trained me, taught me how to talk about evolution as a faith-based belief system. Look at this quote by an evolutionist. He says, quote, I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian, but I must admit that in this one complaint, and Dr. Gish is but one of many that make it, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. Evolution, therefore, came into being as kind of a secular ideology, an explicit substitute for Christianity. At least this guy's being honest. Most of them are not. My goodness, we're going to have to hurry. I'm going to run out of time. Look at this quote. Dinesh D'Souza. Some of you may have seen one of uh, Obama's, two, Obama's 2016 he made last fall. He says, it seems the atheists have developed a comprehensive strategy to win the minds of the next generation. The strategy can be described simply, let the religious people breed them and we will educate them to despise their parents' beliefs. Many people think that the secularization is a consequence of the minds of our young people is the inevitable consequence of learning and maturing. In fact, it is to a large degree orchestrated by teachers and professors to promote anti-religious agendas. He's right. They know exactly what they're doing. They are after the next generation of kids. You know, I remember looking at a quote, and one of these days I'm going to put it in this presentation because I talked about Hitler earlier. Hitler, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he says, 
You don't like what I'm doing? I don't care. I got your kids. That's what the Hitler youth was all about. He had the kids. He didn't care if the parents and the grandparents opposed him. He had the next generation. And if you don't think that's happening, you ought to, let me let you hear out of one of these professors' own mouths right there in the United States. Whoops. Don't have any sound. Tells us loud and clear, and I must say I'm that these are based. I'm going to start it over. Let me see if I can get it again. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear, and I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposive forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. And when you die, you're not going to be surprised because you're going to be completely dead. Now me, now me, if I, if I live after I'm dead, I'm going to be really, really surprised. But at least, at least, I'm going to go to hell where I won't have all those grinning preachers from Sunday morning with me. That's just all, that's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. What an unintelligible idea. Drives me crazy, folks. So many Christians try to be diligent. They raise their kids. They take them to Sunday school, try to teach them the truth of God's word. They grow up, turn 18. Then what do we do? We teach them out, to send them out to a university like University of Tennessee or North Carolina or Virginia where they're taught by a patently anti-God professor, just like this guy. They walk into Biology 101. How many of you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? Maybe your student raises her hand. The professor says, we're going to show you how stupid you are for believing in this religious mumbo-jumbo. We've proved the world's billions of years old. And then they proceed for the whole rest of the semester or year to rip your child or student's faith apart. It happens all the time, folks. I can't tell you the number of people that have come up to me after speaking in churches in tears that they've lost their young people. Charles Haddad Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, the Preacher's Preacher as they call him, who lived back in the 1800s contemporary with Darwin. Look what he said about it. He says, quote, there's not a hair of truth upon this dog of evolution from its head to its tail, but it rends and tears the simple ones. In all of its bearing on scriptural truth, the evolution theory is in direct opposition to scripture. If God's word be true, evolution is a lie. I will not mince the matter. This is not the time for soft speaking. Isn't that what David just said a little while ago? We need to start standing up he says he's tired of all of this stuff that's going on. Tired of beating, being beaten between the head and shoulder. I am too. We're involved in a war. It's a battle between Satan the usurper and Jesus Christ the creator. It's been going on for 6,000 years. And the prize in that battle is the hearts and minds of our kids and grandkids. We need to understand that. Now here's the good news. The Bible's not subjected to the definition of science fiction like evolution is. Why? I'm sorry, creation is not subjected to the definition of science fiction because it's based on the history book of the universe. I was spe speaking down in Port of Spain, Trinidad. My fifth trip down there. I, I've been down there seven total trips. I've spoken in the University of West Indies a number of times. And I made a a, 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 or did a talk very similar to this one and afterwards a young woman she was this second one from the left in the front row she came up to me and she said Mr. Gardner why should I believe the Bible just because you say it's true she says I'm a Hindu we have our own sacred writings about origins and where everything came from why should I believe the Bible just because you say it's true and I like to point out the fact that that is a fair question and you know what people it's what the young people in America are asking their moms and dads today. Why should I believe the Bible, Dad, just because you say it's true? It may be not necessarily be true for me. I think this over here is true. Let me tell you 
why any logical, critical thinking person can come to the conclusion that the Bible really is the word of the creator of the universe. Number one, it was written by over 40 different men in three different languages. Number two, it was written over a period of 1,600 years. That means a lot of those guys weren't even alive at the same time. They could hardly get together and conspire about what to write, could they? Number three, written with one common theme. That is what God is doing in his creation. Number four, written with one common focus. That is the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, redeeming fallen mankind back to himself. It's written with no material errors that affect its veracity in any way. It has never been found to be historically inaccurate, and it has never been found to be scientifically inaccurate when it speaks on matters of science, which it does quite frequently. And that doesn't even address the some 100 plus prophecies that were fulfilled when Jesus Christ came to this earth. Prophecies made hundreds of years before he came. That makes it virtually impossible for that book to be anything but the word of the creator God. But you see, we have an, even have a problem today among God's people. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. How many of you here today believe the Bible contains the word of God? Raise your hand. No, it doesn't contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. David got it right. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and His prophet. I love, by the way, asking that question. It gets, uh, gets, catches everybody the first time. But it's given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, except the parts you don't like, you can ignore those. Is that what it says? No, but that's the way we live, isn't it? I know I've lived that way in the past. I have to own up to it. Oh, I think this part right here, thou shalt not commit murder. I'm good with that. But over here, I don't think he really meant that, so I'm just going to kind of ignore that. Isn't that the way we live? All Scripture. What part about all don't you understand? And you know, there's a passage in the Old Testament, and I'm about done here. Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What part about all don't you understand there? A lot of people, they pointed out earlier in one of the other sessions. A lot of people today in a lot of churches, oh, you don't have to pay attention to the Old Testament. That's written to a whole bunch of dead Hebrew guys that died thousands of years ago. It doesn't apply to us. We live in the church age. Let me tell you, it does apply. And you know what's interesting about that passage? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. Those men wrote down exactly what the Holy Spirit intended for them to write down. But do you know what? For some reason, God took the time to write that passage down himself personally on tablets of stone twice. It's one of the big ten. That's why... Answers in Genesis, why can't it be ministries? Why the Institute for Creation Research sends speakers out? That's why I go out to, to, to churches, conferences, anywhere where we get an invitation and we can put it into the schedule to teach on all these different subjects because individually and collectively, they point to the truth and the authority of God's word. God said exactly what he meant, and he meant exactly what he said. And he doesn't need a bunch of theologians at Bible colleges interpreting it for him. God wants us to know his word. He wants us to study his word. Parents, you need to drag your kids kicking and screaming if you have to to the foot of the cross. Now, you can't save them. But you surely can give them a good, solid foundation in the truth of the Scripture and then bathe them in prayer and ask the Lord in His mercy to save them. That's why we usually bring a lot of books and DVDs and stuff. And thank goodness Gary you know, brought a number of them. We mentioned the answer book one, the most commonly asked questions about creation, evolution, answer book two, and answer book three. And then, of course, that new one, the uh, how do we know the Bible's true? Let me just finish up with this one little comment. Canopy Ministries got an opportunity to speak at a large church in Kingsport, Tennessee. Happened to be very close to where I live. And they asked us to come and do a series. So we agreed to do 13 Wednesday nights in a row. 
It was a large church, about 2,400 on Sunday morning, so we had between six and 800 people each Wednesday night. I gave a lead-off message very similar to this one that I just gave. In fact, it was an earlier version. Afterwards, we were back at the book tables, and we had about seven or eight of these big tables set up, and behind each table was one of the canopy ministry speakers, Dr. White, a PhD in chemistry from Harvard, Dr. Falling, a PhD in organic chemistry from Cal Berkeley, I mean, and on and on. I mean, we had some real horsepower there as far as credentials. And we were answering questions and recommending books, and I noticed a young man standing over here to the right, and he was visibly upset. I imagine David has a lot of people visibly upset sometimes. <laughs> he speaks the, the truth. People don't want to hear the truth anymore, do they? Finally, I turned to him. I said, sir, did you have a, a, a question? He came over in front of me and he said, or he came right in front of me. He says, yeah, I have a question and a comment. I said, go ahead. Are you trying to tell me, he says, are you trying to tell me that I can't be a Christian and believe in evolution too? And I looked at him kind of funny and I said, I'm not really sure where you're coming from. Let me see if I understand. I said, you're a Christian, but you don't believe Genesis because you think that evolutionary scientists have proved the world's billions of years old, so Genesis is wrong. Is that right? He says, that's right. He says, I have a master's degree in biology from East Tennessee State University. I've done the science. I know that evolution's a fact. I said, okay. But you're a Christian, right? He says, yeah, I'm a Christian. I told you that. I said, all right. So you don't believe Genesis because you believe the science has proved it's wrong. But you're a Christian. That means that you believe the Bible when it says that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Is that right? And he says, yeah, I believe that. I said, well, we know from science that virgins don't give birth. I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, rose again the third day to pay your sin debt? Is that right? He says, oh yeah, I believe that. I said, we know from science that dead men don't rise from the dead. He started to get this funny look on his face. and He said, I never thought about it like that. Thirteen weeks later, I rotated back in and all those weeks in between, a different one of the canopy ministry scientists gave talks on how did Noah get all the animals on board the ark and on dinosaurs and you know, all of these things. Anyway, I rotated back in the 13th week, gave the closing message that kind of summed everything up and tied everything together. Was back at the book table, and here come that same young man again. He didn't come up to me, but he came up to Dr. White standing at the table next to me, but I overheard what he said. He said, Dr. White, this is one of the most informative series that I have ever attended. I now understand how a person can believe in evolution and become a Christian, but they won't continue to believe in evolution very long. And I thought, praise the Lord, that young man got the point. We're talking about two different worldviews. They are going in opposite directions. They wind up in two different eternal destinations, each carrying two different sets of eternal consequences. But don't forget what I said earlier. The good news is, if you're on the wrong path, you can change the path that you're on. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the chance and the invitation to come up and speak at this conference. Lord, if this speaker has made any mistake, if I've misspoke, if I've flubbed up the words, just forgive me. But Lord, your word is truth. Lord, bury it in the hearts of the people that you have intended to speak to this weekend. Lord, fire some people up. Get them involved in this battle. Take them off the sideline and make them actively involved in your kingdom. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for everything that comes out of this weekend because that's exactly where the honor and the glory and the praise is due. We thank you for what you did for us, for dying on that cross to provide the payment for our death penalty. Lord, thank you for, for converting the hearts of so many and saving us Lord, if there be any here today that do not know you, that do not have that personal relationship with you, let this be the day of their salvation. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.